Today David's going to describe how easy it is for the home constructor to get involved with digital ATV without breaking the bank, I think, basically, isn't it, Dave? Over to you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Good morning, all. Um, first of all, a uh, quick intro about me. Uh, I've been doing ATV since uh, 1975, but I'm uh, not an electronics professional. Um, I spent 36 years in the Royal Air Force flying, uh, flying various things and doing other stuff around the world. Um, since I retired seven years ago, uh, I've been heavily involved with the British Amish Television Club and uh, specifically the Portsdown project, which was a way of trying to get the people who had done ATV in the 1970s and 80s on AM and uh, FM back into the project in the dig digital age. Um, all, since then, I've also been involved in uh, QO100, how we bring the wideband transponder on that into service for amateur television. So I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, I'll start with a brief review of old ATV and then start talking about what we can do with digital ATV and how the satellite comes into the equation. Um, talk a bit about high definition and how you actually do all this stuff and show you some of the equipment. So when I first started, we were doing AM on 70 SEMs. Um, fairly wide transmissions. Um, and then we went to FM on 23 SEMs, um, which was certainly a wide, because it followed broadcast standards. Now, for those of you who can't see the uh, slide there, that's five megs a division. So it was wide. Um, Essentially, to fill a, tra a satellite transponder was the standard, so about 36 megs. Um, and yes, got nice pictures across town. Uh, the repeaters went okay with it, but we used a lot of bandwidth. Um, but the pictures were noisy. You know, that would be a typical picture. Uh, unless you were right next door. So um, it did look like amateur TV. Transmitters and receivers then, specialised equipment. You know, not many people had CCTV cameras. Uh, you'd then have some sort of modulator. Well, I mean, I started off with a screen grid modulator on a valve. Or, or a Vericap modulator on an FM transmitter, for example. Um, on the receive side, an RF front end into some sort of demodulator, and then a CCTV monitor. And of course, they weren't easily available either. I remember the early conversions of TV sets into CCTV monitors for computers. You know, it was all specialised kit. It wasn't stuff we have around our houses. During the 1990s, the uh, broadcasters started adopting digital TV. Um, now, they did it to save money and make more money. Um, and it really relies on lossy compression. You know, they are losing an awful lot of picture information to send the digital pictures. Um, but it also uses config configurable error correction so they can decide how reliable their picture is. They can put in a lot of error correction and make it very reliable and lose a bit of quality. Or they can have high quality but less reliable in the same uh, channel. The modulations they use can fit multiple bits per second into one hertz. And I had trouble getting my head around this in, in the early days. You know, we always think of an SSB signal being 2.4 kilohertz wide, and we're getting 2.4 kilohertz worth of bandwidth in there. But with digital, in 2.4 kilohertz, you can fit at least 100 ki kilobits per second if you've got a strong enough signal. Now, there are some variants of DV, DVB, digital video broadcasting, and we'll cover those. DVB-S primarily is used on the satellite, 
and DVB-T primarily used by commercial broadcasters for terrestrial. So let, let's have a look at how we do a digital transmitter. We use a, a digital camera of some sort or an analog cap, the old style analog camera, and we capture it in, and get it into digital format. The important thing, first thing we do is compress the video. So we get down from a reason, you know, a fire hose full of data, which comes out of the camera, down to something that will go down a wire. Uh, there are a number of ways we can compress it. Initially, the broadcasters were using MPEG-2. Uh, more recently, H.264. Even more recently, H.265. They're just better ways of compressing as we get better at the maths. And significantly, we get better at building the silicon to do the maths without using a computer. There is uh, another standard called AC1, which is the emerging new standard. Um, it's not at a stage where amateurs can encode it. Amateurs could, amateurs could decode it, but uh, encoding it uh, is probably beyond our com easy computing capability at the moment. So we've now got a compressed video stream, and we need to slot it into a transport stream to transmit it. We need, so we need some sort of synchronization around it so that when you turn on halfway through, you can find where you are. We also need to put some audio in there and probably some information about what the signal is. So we make a transport stream and then we put error correction on it. And as I've said, that's configurable. We can put a lot of error correction in and it's more robust or we can put less in and it's less robust. We then shape the waveform because we've got this lovely square wave of ones and noughts, as you can imagine. Uh, if we transmit that, it's going to be very wide. We shape it and modulate our carrier from the first local oscillator. And we typically do that in an SDR. I'll show you that in a minute. Then, we're still down at one milliwatt level. We put it either into a power amplifier or a transverter. And that will be the same kit as you use for narrowband, as long as it's good enough. <coughs> However, we can make that a lot easier. We can just say, right, this block here, all this computing stuff, we'll do in one computer. All this modulation stuff, we'll do in an SDR. And we've still got our old PA and some sort of camera on the front. So store that thought away, and then we'll look at the receive side. Again, we use our normal aerials that we'd norm use for narrowband. And we need a preamp or converter to get down to somewhere where we can work with. And we put a local oscillator in there and we go down to a zero IF and we demodulate. Don't need to know how we do that. We then use all that lovely error correction we put in to get rid of the errors that were in the stream that have happened because we've sent it over the air. We split the transport stream out. We put the video towards the display, we put the audio towards the speakers, and we perhaps put the data that's in the stream to somewhere else to say, this is GHEKQ. Um, and then we display it and so on. And again, we can do that fairly easily with one box that does the tuner bit and one box that does the computer bit. But of course, we don't need a specialised CCTV monitor anymore because we've all got a display on our smartphone, wherever. Right, let's go into the detail of some of that. On the compression size, uh, side, when we first started doing this, um, uh, amateurs first started playing with digital TV around the year 2000. Um, my first involvement, I think, was 2002. Um, it, you know, it was a 12U 19-inch rack. You didn't need any heating in your shack with that thing running. Uh, and you needed ear defenders for the fans. <laughs> um, the first one I had was a 6U 19-inch rack, X-Broadcast, um, it did actually come out of a skip. Um, 
and it was so noisy that I put it in the shed outside and ran cables. Um, it kept the shed nice and dry. Um, and that used MPEG-2, using lots of ASICs. Now, I mentioned all those encoding means. The Raspberry Pi, which you'll all have heard of, actually includes an H.264 encoder. So we've gone from something, you know, 12U, 6U, 1U rack, down to a Raspberry Pi with a decent H.264 encoder in it. So instantly that opens up what we can do. And that, of course, has been driven by the mobile phone industry who wanted to send video to monetize their data. Even better than that, um, the PC graphics industry, of course, need the same sort of technology. So NVIDIA have re released a small single board computer called the Jetson Nano. Um, and that includes an H.265 encoder. And remember, in that list of encodings, that was the best one that amateurs can do. More recently, we've discovered that uh, recent Intel PCs in the, the normal chipset include an H.264 and an H.265 encoder. So this laptop that I bought four, four years ago that I was just going to do office and presentations on, I found, oh, actually, I can do my video encoding using that laptop. So again, it's, we're going away from needing specialist equipment to do ATV to using the equipment you've got just differently. So we do all, the, all this compression and we add the error correction and now we've got to transmit these, this information over the air. It's simplicity, we could transmit noughts and ones as AM. We could, but it'd be a bit wide and nasty. The way uh, the professionals started doing it was to use QPSK, where you change the phase of the carrier to one of four phases, and that enables you to send two bits of information every time you change the phase. Um, you can take that to the next level and do 8PSK, or 16PSK, or 32. Um, amateur transmissions use all of those. Generally for DX work, we're on QPSK. Because the moment you start putting more dots in your constellation, you need a better signal to noise when you're receiving it to work out, was that dot in that place or was it in that place? So you just need a stronger signal. And the maths has been done. We know exactly how much extra signal we need the more the constellation is. Now DVB, uh, that's for satellite, where you've got a straight path with no multipath. For domestic use, for terrestrial use, that didn't work because of multipath. You remember on the old 625 line transmissions, you get a building reflecting and you get ghost images. That does not play well with QPSK or th those sort of modulations. So they use DVB-T with generally 6,817 carriers. And they put narrowband modulation on each of those carriers. And because it's narrowband modulation, the effects of short duration echoes aren't seen. So that's why they transmit all these all these complicated carriers. Um, and to modulate the information on each of those carriers, they use QPSK or slightly different constellations of quadrature amplitude modulation. And again, the more information they're trying to put on each carrier, the stronger the signal has got to be to get it through. So, talked about um, bandwidth. Commercial satellite TV is generally, they use a symbol rate of 27.5 megabits per second. That's about 36 meg wide, which is one transponder. Now that's not 
we could fit it into 23 SEMs, but you'd need a lot of power to get it through and everybody else would be very grumpy. Um, commercial DVB-T is 8 megs for each channel, but of course in that 8 megs they're running 6, 7 programs or a couple of HD programs. Again, not really practical for our use. The initial tests we did on the amateur bands on 70 SEMs, we were down about the 4 or 2 megs and then 23 megs, main, main, mainly 4 mega symbols. So we've gone from their 32, uh, uh, sorry, their sort of 27.5 megabits per second down to this much to get one or two programs and an audio stream in there. And we can still do this using commercial encoders and commercial receivers. The specification commercially goes down to one mega symbol on the DVBS. So you can buy off of eBay a standard set top box, you can use a surplus encoder and you can do digital TV across town. At a uh, significant ATV meeting between the French and the British ATVers in about um, 2014, I think it was, they had a discussion about this and decided, well, actually, we can extrapolate this commercial standard, which only goes down to one mega symbol, and reduce the bandwidth even further. So we use all the same uh, def definitions in the bitstream, but we just reduce the rate and reduce the bandwidth. Um, and that has been very successful. We've done the same since then for DVB-T. You don't need to have your 8 megs bandwidth. Uh, there were definitions in the standard for 6 meg bandwidth, 1.7 megs bandwidth, which I tripped over because it's not actually 1.7, even though they call it that because it's 1.693 or something. But anyway, um, you can take that bandwidth down and do exactly the same and do narrowband DVB-T. I'll come back to that in a while. Generically, we call all these modes reduced bandwidth TV, RBTV. You'll hear that term occasionally. What does that look like graphically? Um, pre uh, the commercial DVBS uh, encoders, we're about two mega symbols. The waveform wouldn't look like that. We managed to build amateur encoders using a bit of filtering, uh, a, couple of double, a couple of balance mixers, and we would come up with a waveform like that, uh, about three and a half megs wide at 20 dB, um, a bit wider down at 40 dB, because we couldn't get rid of the sidebands, and this is all about shaping the waveform. Unfortunately, the trace isn't quite as uh, bright as I'd like on this one, but this is DVB-S2 out of an SDR from an amateur transmitter. Um, that's one mega symbol, so we've come down in bandwidth, but it, relatively it's the same as the one on the left there. It's only a 10 meg span as opposed to a 20 meg span. And you can see it's 1.4 megs wide at 20 dB, and it's still 1.4 megs wide at 40 dB. So that is how we would like to transmit. You see it's got slightly soft edges. Uh, DVB-S or S2 always has slightly, slightly soft edges. This one here on the right um, is DVB-T. And because it's just made up of lots of carriers there, it's got hard edges. Uh, and again, one, that's a one megs bandwidth, because we talk in terms of bandwidth for DVB-T. And it's one meg wide all the way down, you hope. I'll come back to that as well. <laughs> Error correction. This is the hardest bit of maths that the kit has to do, but we don't get involved in it. Um, it's forward error correction. It uses a proportion of the bitstream for to provide this error correction. Um, the amount of bitstream that is used for error correction, the amount that is used for sending the signal, is used, expressed as a fraction. You know, for we, one of the common ones is a half, where half the bitstream is used for error correction and half is actually the information you want to get through. For amateur use, I recommend two-thirds, where two-thirds of it is the information you want 
and a third is error correction. That seems to be about the best compromise. Um, at, at one end of the scale, you can go up to nine tenths, where you're only sending a tenth of error correction. The other end of the scale, you can go down to uh, a quarter, where a quarter of the signal is the real signal, and three quarters of it is error correction. Wasted? Well, if it gets the signal through, even though the signal's not as much, it's not wasted. It swings and roundabouts. It's really quite easy to encode the error correction. The problem is decoding it. Um, we use uh, an FPGA in the tuner to do that um, decoding. You can do it on a high-end PC, but it's tricky to set up and it's not a, a beginner's recommended way. And the, this tuner on the right here includes an ASIC to do the job, as do the DVB-T tuners. So, what does this give ATV? We can tailor our symbol rate. Now, remember, symbol rate equals bandwidth uh, with, uh, by proportion. The type of modulation and the error correction for what you want to do. So, it, for DX, we'd use a low symbol rate, lots of error correction. Uh, for local, you can use a higher symbol rate. Um, but if you're sending amateur pictures, you rarely need more than one and a half megs bandwidth. So the end result is we are sending really good pictures in a lot less bandwidth than we used to for analog. Um, if I show you this, this image here is an off-air spectrum view from the top of a hilltop in uh, Dorset. I was trying to receive M0 DTS, who was on the North York Moors. That's his signal there. It's one, it was a 125 kilosymbol symbol, uh, signal, so it's about 150 kilohertz wide. And you can see he's round about 6 dB, 5 dB above the, the local noise level. Um, at the same time, this was during a TV contest, somebody else was using another frequency on 70 sems with a 333 kilosymbol symbol signal. So I could see that. This signal here was right on the limit. I needed a bit of aircraft flutter or something for it to come out of the noise and, and decode. But you're only looking at a little hump about 6, 7 dB above the noise to get a signal through. And that's the advantage of the error correction. So the way we've taken this forward for terrestrial ATV is we've said, OK, all our old repeaters used to be quite, use quite a lot of bandwidth, four mega symbols wide or something like that. We've now got the, the kit to do good video coding using one mega symbol, so they're only about 1.4 megs wide, uh, FEC two thirds, and we can still use commercial decoders that you can buy for 10 quid off eBay, commercial receivers. So you buy your 10 quid receiver off of eBay, you plug an HDMI display in one end, you plug a preamp and a 23 sem aerial in the other end, and you can receive your local repeater. So you're not into buying specialist kit like you were in the old days, and that's why things have moved forwards. For simplex, if you want to do longer distances, you wind the bandwidth down because it will go further. Um, and for DX, perhaps you wind the bandwidth down even more because you're not worried about the, you know, whether you can see the hairs on his face. You're worried about whether you can get the picture through. Um, we can use H.264 encoding from a Raspberry Pi, H.265 from a Jetson or a uh, PC. And the sort of results we're getting during the last ATV contest, somebody actually, we hit some sporadic E and there was a contact from PA0 down to the southern end of Italy, 1,700 kilometres, uh, which we've been hoping would happen for a long time, but of course you need everything to align. During the same contest, somebody was using the same modulation on 122 gigs and got 5.9 kilometres 
which I think is an equally impressive uh, uh, achievement. I mentioned that the broadcasters use DVB-T for terrestrial, and we use, uh, and the um, satellite broadcasters use DVB-S. Now the assumption we've always had is that, well, perhaps we ought to be using DVB-T for our point-to-point -point terrestrial. We started with DVB-S because that was the equipment that was coming out of the skip. Um, it's also easier to amplify DVB-S S2 because the peak to null ratio on the um, transmission isn't so high, so it's easier to linearly amplify it and not get horrible sidebands and intermod products. Um, DVB-S and S2 decoders seem to lock quicker, which if you're dealing with a fading signal is very important. The problem we thought we might have with DVB-S was multipath. But in the same way as DVB-T uses lots of carriers with not very fast modulation on them to avoid multipath, we've somewhat taken that problem away from DVB-S because we've reduced the modulation rate to something the broadcast has never even tested. And we find it isn't susceptible to multipath. It's not really an issue for us. I have yet to see any evidence that DVB-T performs better for us. And S is easier to do, so that's why we're going down that route. OK. We were very lucky uh, about over the last 10 years in that negotiations have gone on to have two transponders on a Qatari satellite, s Hale 2 um, There are two, the two transponders on there is the narrow one, 500, which is about 500 kilohertz wide, and the wide band one, which is about 9 megs wide. It's 2.4 gigs up, so S band up, and 10.49 gigs down. P one thing to be cautious of here is people think, oh, I can do D Cure 100 narrowband, so I ought to be able to do TV. Not quite true, because the link budget for TV is very tight. We are uh, working quite close to the limits on this. There is a demo of it downstairs. Um, coverage is enormous. You can just about see the sort of yellow circle on there. That's the coverage. So uh, North America and Australia are feeling a bit left out of this. Um, but day to day, you see users from Brazil through to India, South Africa, not so much Russia nowadays, but we have had Russian users. Um, about 250 users have registered, but I am sure there are more of them. Now, we've only got seven megs available bandwidth on this transponder. The transponder is 9 megs wide, but if you look at this spectrum view here, the, l the lower 2 megs is used by a beacon. Now, you'd say that's a waste. Actually, I don't think it is, because it makes aligning to the satellite so much easier. Um, it really is worth its weight in gold. But the rest of the transponder, you can fit about... 15 to 20 tra TV transmissions in there using our narrowband techniques. Um, the broadcasters, when we're, I've talked to some commercial broadcasters who, are, who run uh, satellite news gathering links, they said, well, how do you coordinate it? Well, it's all on a voluntary basis, but with a chat. So we've stood up a, um, a receiver. It's actually hosted for us by Goonhilly Earth Station. Um, and that serves on the web, this spectrum view you see on the left-hand side, and a chat server. So you can tell people, you can ask people what they're doing. Because you know, all you see on the receiver, on the spectrum view, is a spike there. Now, you can probably guess what he's doing and decode it 
Or you can ask him what he's doing. Or you could tell him he's got problems with it. Or you can make suggestions about improvements. And it's been a game changer in getting people's signals better and in development of new techniques. Just having this chat ch channel, which is a sort of public forum where people can talk technical about how to get good signals on through the satellite. Uh, I want to run a quick video. Um, let me just do the IT bit and run that. And show you the sort of pictures we get through the satellite. I just need to get the mouse to, to the start button and then we'll go. G8 GKQ. Main activity, uh, getting a, a Portstown update out the door. Uh, that introduced the uh, C930 camera. Okay, quite a lot of us on tonight, so please try and keep the overs short. Round to Mike, G0MJW. I just thought I'd show you this, since it's topical. Um, this is the latest overall forecast, the ovation forecast from the Met Office after the two uh, space weather events that uh, that happened today. That's going to be a pretty big aurora. And um, good to uh, hear everyone and see everyone. I've seen a few people testing so far, so uh, look forward to uh, seeing what uh, is said. Right, in uh, in the interest of keeping over short, here is the, uh, the bench, uh, just to show you what's on there. There is bits have arrived this week, but I've not had much chance to do anything. Slightly out of shot, in fact I shall move it so that it's not out of shot, here's this, it'll be interesting to see if that's any good for DATV purposes, that's uh, one of the new Pi Zero Mark IIs, so uh, let's pass it round, uh, M0YDH, G0MJW. Okay, uh, what have I been doing since I last came on? Well, I haven't been coming on too often, um, it's... Uh, Thing. We'll, get, we'll go for a wobbly, shaky cam. And uh, first of all, the all-important die-cast box containing a Pluto, which mysteriously then connects automatically first time. Amazing. We should all do that. So I, I went to a workshop and I made something. So I made a, I made a device, which. Uh, G7, G7 NTG should be playing, not me, there you go. It's a cigar box guitar. Somebody else mentioned just now a, uh, a load for testing power supplies. Well, I, I use a very simple one, which uh, I've been using for years for testing high power audio amplifiers. And it's just two whacking great four ohm wire wound resistors and a switch on the front which puts them in series or parallel i think i'll, I'll just show i'll just show jim this uh, picture because he might might be interested in it this is uh, this is the pa uh, that i made up yeah and that's the inside of it so um i follow very much the pictures that um uh, that jim provided of his in the write-up Okay, 70 cents cavity, and it's been turned into one of those. A couple of SMA sockets and some probes. Um, and with a, a single rod, it tunes 24 cents quite happily. Right, good evening all. Uh, literally in from work probably about 10 minutes ago, so... Uh, Right, a few things to show, um, and just one last thing before I hand over to David. Uh, let me just show you this. I tweeted this on uh, Twitter the other day, but um, basically this is, I think it must be a switch mode power supply, but it's on 24-7 around here. It's never, ever off. So uh, that area there is MFS. So, uh, with that, I will uh, close the net, but uh, say uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody for coming on. Look forward to seeing as many of you as possible on the air on uh, Sunday on 70 SEMS. Uh, let's get the right slide.
slide. There we go. Okay, so that's the flavour of what the uh, quality of stuff we can do on Q100. That's our Thursday highlights from our Thursday evening net. Thanks to Mike for his starring role there. Uh, keeping on the theme of Mike, we, up till now we've been doing, you know, 20 years ago we were doing standard definition pictures. In 333 killer symbols using H265, we can easily do high definition pictures. This doesn't do it justice. That is a 12, a, a, a 1080 high, def high definition picture and looks really good. I actually realized I don't have a way of capturing a high definition picture, even though I can display it in my shack. Um, but you know, in 500 kilohertz, we can get HD across. Um, now, you couldn't show a Grand Prix in high definition because it moves too fast, but it's the sort of stuff we do, works fine. Okay, uh, in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about transmission techniques. You'll remember this slide uh, where we have you know, camera, computer, modulator. How do we do that? Well, camera, standard webcam, that works fine, or the camera in the, in the front of your laptop. Uh, computer. You can either use a uh, standard laptop, a Raspberry Pi built into something like this. Um, that is a full TV transmitter in that box. That's the port stand transmitter with a Raspberry Pi in there. And you need some sort of STR to get the signal out. Something like a Pluto, which many of you will have seen. There's one built into that box. Or, or a Lime STR. In a, in a fancy case, that one. So we can do this using consumer stuff. You don't need to solder stuff together that much. On the receive side, um, we talked about having a tuner and a computer. Yet again, um, we can use this box here, which is a satellite tuner on a PCB that's generally available from the BATC, all the details of how to build it on the wiki. Really simple construction. Preamp in there and a USB lead out of there to whatever computer you want to go to. This um, transmitter will also act as the computer for the receiver. Or you can use some free software on a PC. Or we've got another project which uses a Raspberry Pi as a set-top box receiver. So that's USB in from the mini tuner, HDMI out to a display. Again, all consumer type stuff. Now, you, you need to go into your mini tuner anywhere between 144 and, and 2450 megs. That says 2350. Sorry, that's an error. It's 2450 is the answer. Um, so you go in there, but you need a preamp or a transverter in front of it because they're designed to work with thing, LNBs that have 30 or 40 dB of gain. On the transmit side, an SDR will cover anywhere between 70, 70 and 3.5 gigs or, five, or 6 gigs if it's a Pluto. But it only gives you about a milliwatt out and you need to amplify that out. And again, for, um, you need that gain both on transmit and receive. Transmission linearity is a problem, though. You remember that lovely bit of spectrum there? Well, if you put that into a normal SSB PA, that's what you get. Now, people ask me, how high is acceptable on these shoulders? Because you know, the more power you run, the higher those shoulders are. The answer is, what's here? Is that in a quiet bit of an amateur band? Well, perhaps if you're not upsetting anybody, it doesn't matter that much. But if that is out of band, that's clearly un unacceptable. If it's the local repeater, it's unacceptable. It's a, it's a balance. For Q100, you probably need a 1.2 meter dish if you're going to do TV. But you only need a domestic LNB like that. Uh, if you're going to transmit, the feed is a couple of bits of copper, cut very nicely, but that's what you need. 
and this is the LNB bit in the middle with the lens on which is salvaged from a commercial LNB. Power amplifiers, we are into using ex-mobile telephone transmitters. There's a guy in Poland who's made a fortune selling these. I'm not sure whether Poland is without mobile t telephone coverage, but he's certainly made a lot of money. <laughs> um, and generally, uh, large Philips devices, BLV type devices on those. Last couple of items. Um, I mentioned the chat. That has led to a lot of innovation. Um, one of the things is click, uh, something called QuickTune. This is a bit of software that runs on a PC and takes uh, the signal from Goon Hilly and you just click on the signal and it tunes your receiver to it. So there's no entering numbers, it puts it straight in. And the other thing I mentioned was this set-top box style ride receiver, which is a new approach to receiving ATV. So, I hope I've shown you some of the new horizons, how we've gone. We've got DATV that goes further because we're using digital with error correction. We've got intercontinental digital ATV. Uh, equipment, you can use consumer equipment to a large extent. And we've got the innovation through collaboration. So thank you for uh, listening to my quick run through.